Today is Friday, October 16th, 2020. My name is Evan Solis. I'm interviewing Paul Michael Saldana for the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Please know, Mr. Saldana, that this interview will be placed in the Nettie Lee Benson Latin American Collection at UT Austin. If there's anything you do not wish to answer or talk about, I will honor your wishes. Also, if there is something you want to talk about, please bring it up and we'll talk about it as well. Because we are not conducting this interview in person, I need you to record you consenting to a few questions. So I'll ask you a series of five questions. Please say, yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree uh, after each of them. There are three questions we need to make sure you agree to before we go on. First, Voces wishes to archive your interview along with any other photographs and other documentation at the Benson Library at UT Austin. We will retain copyright of the interview and any other materials you donate to Voces. Do you give Voces consent to archive your interview and your materials at the Benson Library? Yes, I agree. Thank you. Do you grant Voces copyright over the interview and any material you provide? Yes, I agree. Okay. Do you agree to allow us to post this interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people around the world? Yes, I agree. Fantastic. All right, thank you. So now there's two other questions. We have many questions in a pre-interview form that we've already filled out. We use that info from the pre-interview form to help in research. That entire form is kept in a secure Voces server. Before we send it to the Benson Library, we strip out any of the contact information for yourself and your family members. So that will not be part of your public file. Your public file will only be accessible at the Benson Library. Do you wish for us to share the rest of your interview in your public file available to researchers at the Benson? Yes, it's fine. Mm -hmm. And then on occasion, Voces receives requests from journalists who wish to contact our interview subjects. We only deal with legitimate news outlets. Do you give consent for us to share your phone numbers or your email with journalists? Yes, I do. All right, fantastic. All right, well, good. That's all that. And we're recording fine. So yeah, so Paul, um, so I have sort of some outline of questions that, um, that I'd like to ask you. But again, you know, this is sort of a free flowing conversation. So don't feel limited to any one thing. But I figured a good place to start might be to ask you about your current involvement with the organization Zabla and the Austin Latino Coalition. Um, and I wonder if you can talk first just about how these organizations originated. We can talk start with, which, with whichever one you prefer. Um, and then we can talk a bit about how they uh, have evolved in this pandemic time, especially. So can you tell us a bit about sort of how you got involved and how you started these projects? Sure, well, let's start with ABLA first. Um, so ABLA, Hispanic Advocates Business Leaders of Austin, uh, is a community organization that probably started over 25 years ago now. Uh, and it uh, ha happened or, or was organized over a series of platicas or conversations with other Latino community leaders. Initially, the focus was um, on public education. Um, and so, um, and then it eventually evolved into ABLA talking about and taking a leadership active role on various Latino quality of life issues. Um, and so obviously when social media uh, became sort of the frenzy, we moved our ABLA uh, forums, if you will, in addition to in-person roundtable platica conversations, we moved them online through Facebook, Twitter, all those types of things. And I would say um, over the course of the last 25 years, uh, there were always periodic gatherings of the ABLA organization but probably within the last 10 to 15 years, we have consistently met monthly. Uh, the last Wednesday of every month, we would get together and uh, at Juan in the Millions and the casita in the back, uh, Juan and Mirna Mesa, the owners of Juan in the Millions were gracious enough to offer us their space. Um, and so, um, and we would have a, 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 you know, various conversations um, with, uh, with Abla and the forum and work slowly got out. Um, we do a, a e-newsletter that we still produce that put that we put out every week, um, and uh, and then obviously when the pandemic hit, we we felt that it was absolutely important to ensure that we maintained uh, the Latino presence in the conversations that were occurring virtually, because what we were seeing and hearing from our members is that uh, there weren't people being represented who looked like us uh, and could talk about the issues that Abla had been facilitating. So we now have been doing really throughout most of the pandemic um, weekly platicas um, and sometimes we'll have more than one on the various topics that we've been able to do. Um, Austin Latino Coalition was formed uh, in 2013 
Uh, and initially the Austin Latino Coalition involved about a dozen Latino trusted organizations. The focuses were on civic engagement and Latino organizations and the community being involved in the political process, whether it was encouraging people to register to vote, uh, providing forums or public education to people learn about the candidates and the issues. Um, and then in 2013 was also when Austin as a city was having a conversation about geographic representation and bringing single member districts to the manner in which we elect our city council members. Uh, and just by way of background, uh, prior to then, the city had brought that item forward as a charter referendum, public referendum uh, on the ballot and it had, sick, it had failed six times already. So we felt the seventh time might be the charmer. And so we felt it was important for Latinos to be front and center. And we formed a partnership and created this Austin Latino Coalition, again, which involved about 12 uh, Latino trusted organizations. And so we, be we became part of the uh, people's movement, if you will, in pushing for geographic representation, the 10-1. Uh, eventually we were successful in working in partnership with the African-American community, the communities that had been marginalized in Austin. And we were successful in getting the passage of 10-1, which is why we have the 10-1 system now. And so obviously uh, during the pandemic, we're now week 41 of the pandemic. Uh, our focus and emphasis um, uh, has been for the Austin Latino community is to focus on working on um, meeting the voids and the gaps that have been left by government at all levels, the federal government, the state government, and even here in Austin, Texas, uh, the connection with ABLA is that ABLA is now, you know, has been part of, of the Austin Latino Coalition since day one. Um, the Austin Latino Coalition has now grown to 15 uh, trusted Latino organizations that are either nonprofit, nonprofit profits, civic or community organizations. And then we have about a 30 plus Latino leaders who are part of the coalition uh, as well. And so um, as far as how the Austin Latino Coalition evolved and the focus on the COVID pandemic was we started having conversations. And when I say we, some of the individual members of the coalition and then individual leaders were having conversations and expressing growing concerns about how the COVID pandemic was disproportionately impacting um, our communities in various ways. And um, then we decided to uh, uh, revamp and, or, or reinstitute the, and bring back the Austin Latino Coalition, if you will, in active mode and started having a series of conversations with our elected officials. Uh, and that process probably started in March and April. Uh, and then we started having regular meetings uh, with individual council members, with the mayor, the leadership. Uh, and then uh, it sort of grew from that. And uh, that's kind of where we are. So it sounds like it's had several iterations kind of ebbs and flows and, and when the need is there. And um, I, I, there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot I could ask you about here, but I think I um, will start just in the now. So that this, you know, this, this void that you're talking about, these organizations meeting and serving the Latino population here in Austin and this disproportionate impact that the, that the pandemic is having. Can you talk a bit about that? Um, you know, for anyone who's watching this down the line and doesn't, have the exact information here in Travis County, here in Austin. I mean, what does that impact look like? What are those voids where the Hispanic population is, is being ignored or and is suffering as a result? Sure, so let me maybe fast forward to probably the pivotal part of our um, organizing and having conversations with the elected officials was probably a meeting that we did with the mayor uh, in the first week of uh, May, although we started having conversations with him in March and April. Uh, but the meeting in May was was pivotal, uh, instrumental in my part, uh, in my opinion, um, as far as setting the tone for what we did later on was, you know, the intent of our conversation with Mayor Adler at that time was uh, to let him know and inform him of our observations, uh, not only as members of the Austin community, but specifically as representatives of the Latino community and as Latinos ourselves. And our, and our uh, observations were, that the city and Austin public health were not providing information to the community, specifically to our community in Spanish. Uh, we had to remind him that our community is not monolithic. Uh, the fact that we have at least 25 subcultures, if we will, of Latino 
um, you know, despite I personally wear my Mexican American badge of honor, you know, with with honor, but the fact is that we're not all Mexican American, right? And so um, we also uh, educated him on the fact that on the city's website at that time, the only Spanish translation was the link that said click here for Spanish and it was a 70 plus page PDF document, which people in English wouldn't even read. Uh, our observations were that the weekly press briefings and briefings that we're doing were only provided in English. Uh, and, um, and we basically gave him some other, you know, said, we said, look, this is what our fear is. We're seeing the numbers are starting to go up specifically for the Latino community. And, and the fact that, you know, we are also, um, uh, you know, subject to chronic diseases. Uh, we're overrepresented um, as economically disadvantaged communities. Um, we're overrepresented in the historic, um, uh, you know, the history of racism and inequities and all those things, classism. Um, and so we were, we were concerned uh, about, about those things. And what we told the mayor was, um, you, we, 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 are two, we had uh, two asks. One was for him to create a Latino task force um, and that this Latino task force would work in partnership with the city and Austin Public Health in developing a mitigation plan. The mitigation plan would specifically focus on creating a bilingual, culturally relevant public education prevention campaign. Um, it would focus on providing, identifying, and then providing resources in the Latino community. And we had predicted back in April and May that among the disparities and the needs and the voids was that we were gonna to need to make sure that our people are gonna have access to the PPE supplies, right? And remember early on during this pandemic, it was very difficult to get a hold of those things. And if you were able to find mask or hand sanitizer, it was very expensive. People were already starting to do the price gouging and all those other things, and it wasn't readily available. And then we were gonna concern, we were growing, we had concerns about the availability of testing and testing without barriers. And then identifying the fact that if the government was gonna be responsible for facilitating and managing and operating the testing sites, then we expressed concern for our undocumented immigrant community and that there was a lack of trust with governmental entities for fear of deportation, for fear of sharing information with ICE officials, uh, you know, and even to some extent law enforcement and all of those things. And so when we asked the mayor this, he, his response was no, that he wasn't going to do that. Um, and that he understood our concerns. Um, and so um, tempers flared. It was a big meeting. I, I ended up facilitating that. We probably had 30 people on a Zoom call. Um, the mayor and his staff, uh, Council Member Pio Renteria was part of that meeting as well. Um, we had State Representative Gina Hinojosa was part of that meeting as well, and then various community leaders. And so I can't remember, it may have been Gilbert Rivera, Cortez Rivera, who said, well, then I guess we're gonna to have to do a press conference or press event to say that you're not willing to work with us. And then the mayor's response was, well, you guys do what you need to do. And so that kind of just served as, a, as a inspiration for us. Um, I think we were angry, we were disappointed to say the least, but then at the same time, um, and I don't, again, I don't remember who said it, but it was, we were quickly reminded as a group that Latinos are used to fending for themselves and this would be no different. And so um, we didn't need anybody's help that we could do for ourselves. And that became our personal mantra moving forward from there on out. And so that was over 27 weeks ago and here we are. Uh, and so over the course of these 27 weeks, our focus and emphasis had been on exactly being the volunteer Latino task force, implementing the mitigation plan, doing a PSA campaign, bilingual culturally relevant, um, social media PSAs, um, and then doing the um, uh, facilitating um, barrier-free access to COVID testing and doing it in the communities and the areas geographically within the city that have continued to have the high levels of COVID cases and positivity rates. And then working in partnership with the churches like the Diocese of Austin, where we could offer barrier-free uh, testing, COVID testing, to frontline workers and to, and, and to anybody for that matter uh, that would be interested in needing to have access to a test. And we continue to do that. And over the course of these 27 weeks, 
you know, we were subjected to the bureaucracy of the, of the process, we would hear uh, people uh, provide their per personal testimony of their experiences and trying to get a test. Um, there's an assumption still, Austin, Texas in 2020, that there's not a digital divide and that's not true. There's an assumption that everybody has access to the internet and we know that is not true. So most of the testing opportunities required individuals to have an email address and then be able to access the city's portal system to schedule uh, and fill out paperwork virtually or, or online, if you will. And again, folks in our, um, in our community were hesitant if they were undocumented because it asked for a lot of personal information. Um, senior citizens um, didn't know how to access that information. Um, and then um, people would show up to testing sites and they would run out of test uh, or they just didn't want to go. Um, I mean, you name it, it was just all kinds of barriers um, that we would hear. And then we would hear the stories of people already being infected and sick, where it was the entire family and they were self-medicating or relying on the religion to, to cure themselves. Um, and so um, I think honestly, all of us, and like I said, there are 30 plus individuals, all of us have had our peaks and valleys uh, emotionally. Uh, for me, I know I can only speak for myself. You know, I went through a mental health breakdown because I wasn't prepared to see uh, firsthand what I saw. I got very emotional, I think, after my first testing event uh, that I went to, because at this time, it was early on in the pandemic, we we're all fearful. We didn't know how you could potentially be exposed to it. And so that was another thing that we had to decide on a personal level is, okay, we have our own families, we all have our full-time jobs, we have our families, we have all these things. So do we want to potentially uh, subject ourselves to exposure? Uh, and then, you know, how do you handle that? Um, and so, I, you know, my first event, I was very tentative, nervous, I went. Um, I don't regret it uh, at all. I think if anything, it served as a motivation for me later on, uh, as I think has happened with everybody who continues to volunteers, and that is, seeing the look of despair of people in our community who look like us, um, you know, the parents, when we were doing testing, the testing events would take start at seven o'clock in the morning. People would show up in the church parking lots at five o'clock in the morning, two or three hours before. And it wasn't just the frontline workers or the construction workers. It was the whole familia and the kids. The kids is the one that really got to me, right? The senior citizen and the kids in particular were there and just seeing the look of despair, right? Uh, in their faces, worried uh, about it. And, uh, and then at the same time, then seeing the relief because we were doing early on, we would do the PCR test, the nasal, and then the antibody test, which was more like a, uh, they would pick your finger, get blood, and then you would get your results within 15 minutes. Those at that time were not a reliable testing source. So it sort of did create sort of a false sense of security in that when they got the test results, said, no, you're negative, but they still had to wait for the PCR, the nasal test. And at that time was taking, you know, two weeks, three weeks, a month in some instances. And that gets back to some of the personal testimony that we would hear where people who would go to Austin Public Health or Central Health. Central Health is the organization that's responsible for providing indigent health care to the indigent community that people were waiting you know, sometimes more than 30 days to get a testing result. And they would be required to call uh, a number, which was only in English, nothing in Spanish, or they would have to go and access the portal system email and they would get lost in the system. And again, people got really frustrated with that. And I still tell the story today is like, okay, somebody who grew up here in Austin, I felt at times as if our Latino community here in Austin was made to feel and experiencing what it was like to, to be a second class citizen again during the whole civil rights movement when you would see the signs about not serving Mexicans or Mexican Americans. Uh, or I felt like we were living in a third world country where you would have people who felt uh, so much anxiety and despair that they would stand in line and have their kids up at in a parking lot or in a street at five o'clock, three hours, just before the start of testing. And then depending on how long the line was, 
they could potentially be there for six or eight hours with their kids waiting in line to get a test, right? And it made me angry uh, and sad and all of those things. And we all went through that whole experience. And so again, for me personally, that's been my personal motivation is to see that that first day, like I said, when I went through that testing, I cried like a baby all the way home. I was really, hold on a second. It's still hard to talk about it. Yeah, that first day was hard. So I, I had to make a decision whether that was something that I should still continue doing, you know, uh, as Latinos, you know, I'm 54. We, we're brought up to be machismo and not talk about how you feel and all those things. But at the same time, as a parent, you know, I saw my kids. Uh, and this year I became an abuelo and I have a 10 month old uh, grandson. So I saw the faces and the kids of, of my family members. And so I had to make that decision but at the same time, I felt if I, if I can't, if, you know, I need to take care of myself first, because if I'm not taking care of myself physically and mentally, then I can't help anybody else. So, you know, I, I figured out a way to deal with that and talking about it, like I'm talking to you, um, you know, and I started off my morning every morning with the, with a walk, just be by myself. And that was my way to sort of decompress to kind of reflect on what I've been doing that week, not only with the, the volunteer, but my work and everything going on personally in our lives. And so that was very therapeutic and worked out really well for me. But then that was probably, for me personally, again, uh, a pivotal moment in that it just says you got to do it, right, kind of thing. And so, yeah, and, and I haven't looked back since then. And, and the true, and the same thing holds true with everybody who's part of our organization, you know, there have been some who are part of our coalition who have been, uh, who tested positive. We had one of our members who was hospitalized, uh, who almost passed. We've had members of our coalition who have lost um, parents and brothers, abuelos, you name it. And so it, it has become very personal for, for all of us. Um, and again, that's indicative of our cultura uh, in the Latino community, even if it's not somebody that's directly related to us, there's a joke, right? We see somebody who got to him, we say, hey, primo, we adopt them as our primos, right? You know, or see somebody who has a name like ours, they become our tocayos, right? And so our compadres. And so, and that's what I love about our community. You know, the, the anger that we had turned into motivation and passion. Um, and, and also, I think for me, it also turned into orgullo from the perspective of that seeing so many people from our community stepping up, even though noticing they would be putting themselves at risk, we're willing to take that risk to serve people in our community, right? And so that has also been very inspirational, right? And so it has just become an also, it, it really has become a full-time job. It has become a full-time job. You know, I did, um, I did one meeting today <laughs> for work and the rest of my time today has been doing stuff. After this, I'm gonna do another call about the coalition work that we're doing, um, but I feel that I have to do it. And anybody who's part of our coalition will tell you the same thing. I've been talking to five other coalition members and they're also spending their time doing these things. And, you know, again, that gets back to when we told us, when we were told no, then that served as, as a reminder that we're resilient as a community. And, and we've been able to, we've fend for ourselves many times and this is no other, this isn't any different and we got to continue doing it. I just, there's so much uh, that I want to ask you about that, uh, but I think just broad strokes, 27 weeks later, right, 27 weeks after you get this rejection from the mayor, which I also want to talk about, but but in, in this time and, and you've gone through this personal experience, I mean, today, my understanding is that the rates in Travis County are low, you know, that the overall situation has, has certainly improved from what it was, but I mean, what is changed for y'all and the work in the community and i mean that both are you seeing the community that you are serving get better or are the, are the, are the how are the rates you know how is the disproportionality of this getting better or not getting better how is it changing and also just you know you mentioned your own mental health and and, and those of, of the people who you're working with i mean how is it 
changed over time. Obviously, it's still affecting you. It affects you very deeply. But I mean, how are you as this goes on and on and on and it looks like it will continue to go on and on and on? Mm -hmm. How are you managing that? How are you dealing with that? So um, while the overall numbers have improved, um, uh, and, and remind me, I'll tell you about a conversation that I had with the, with the mayor uh, when the when he and the other officials were starting to say it was getting better. But if you look at the numbers, the Latino community is still disproportionately impacted. And I've learned more than I've ever wanted to learn about a pandemic and certainly about COVID. But we actually now do weekly uh, snapshots of the data nationally, on the state level, and locally. We I do a report. It comes out every Tuesday. I need to put you on my email list so I can get that to you. But we look at what's happening nationally and on the state level and locally. And in every instance, in every level, Latinos are disproportionately impacted. Um, um, on the national level, Latinos under the age of 18 represent the majority of the COVID cases. Um, and under the age groups of the, those who have died under 21, Latinos are over 45% on the national level. On the state level, Latinos are uh, 56% of the deaths. And then here in Austin, Travis County, Latinos are 50% of the deaths. And while the overall numbers have gone down, Latinos continue to be at 50% or above of the cases, hospitalizations, and then deaths. Uh, the conversation I was having before I came on you was talking about a friend that we're going to do on Sunday at the mural at Michicate. You're welcome to join us. Wear a mask if you want to come. Um, but uh, so that hasn't changed uh, at all. And so we've educated ourselves and learned more about all that stuff. But I also have to say part of our coalition, remember we have 15 organizations, are groups like the uh, Latino Healthcare Forum. Um, this is something that they specialize in. They work directly with our community in the health inequities, whether it's the chronic diseases. And so a lot of the things that we are know now is a result of you know, the, the work and the advice that we're getting from Latino Healthcare Forum, Joe Ramirez in particular, who's the president and CEO of that organizations, right? And again, too, the fact that so many of us have had family members affected or impacted by it. So we've learned from each other in this process and then working directly with, um, you know, now the city, Austin Public Health, Central Health, Community Care, the governor's office. Um, we've gotten national media attention uh, I had somebody call me from the LA Times and talked about the presidential race and what I told him exactly what I'm telling you, this is personal for me, you know, sure it's about the issues, but it's sort of like, we need a moral compass in this community, you know, and on the national level. And for me, it's personal because of everything that I'm telling you. Um, so, you know, again, the numbers have, have, have improved, but not for the Latino community. And what we're seeing basically is the, unfortunately, the matriculation of people becoming positive getting sick, getting sick to the point where they have to be hospitalized, being in a hospital, going on a ventilator, and then dying. And so once you get to a point where you are on a ventilator, then the likelihood of you being able to survive that is very, very slim. Because keep in mind that Latinos are also overrepresented in the chronic diseases, heart, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, all of those things then you become more vulnerable to becoming a statistic in that the success rate of you being able to be healed or cured is probably going to be not too good if you are you know susceptible you're more susceptible to a negative outcome because of the chronic diseases and again that's that's what's happening i'll tell you the story of constable george morales and this this is public information who george is part of our coalition george's father passed away from uh, covid uh, George's father, uh, Jesse Morales Chewy, went to school with my father. And so we all go to Our Lady Guadalupe Church. My kids are fifth generation. My grandson is now the sixth generation of, uh, of, from the Our Lady Guadalupe Church, but they went to school together. Uh, and so, you know, before the pandemic, his parents would sit next to my parents at church, right? And so, but George's uh, uh, son, I mean, uh, uh, one of his brothers is still on a ventilator. He's an induced coma. His mother is sick too. And so it's very personal for him, right, as well too. So we, we just see this. So it, 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 it bothers me when um, you'll have people in our community who are all coming from positions of privilege. You and I are 
our privilege and that we're able to have this conversation. So when they say, man, just wear a mask or, you know, geez, why can't we open up the bars again and these things, um, that's insulting to, to the people that have died uh, in our community. In Latino community right now, as of this week, 220 people, Latinos from the, from the Austin Latino community have died. I think the death rate overall in Austin, Travis County, I think it's at 447 thereabouts, 437, 440. Um, so it's an insult and we have to kind of keep that in mind. So I take it personal. So I remember when the rates started to go down overall, the mayor and Dr. Escott, who's the health authority and others were sort of patting themselves on the back, on their back. And I sent a text message to the mayor and he called me and he and I got into a shouting match. And I said, I said, I'm offended by your social media postings uh, and you're patting yourselves in the back when there's people in my community who are still dying. And, why, and, I, and I just let him have it. I said, here we are. And I can't remember what week we were at that time saying, why is it that a group of volunteers who are not getting paid are having to do a step up where you as a city, you as the mayor have failed our community. And I would remind him of the water boil notice last year where they gave out water. To me, it's like a, it's a no brainer. If you know this COVID pandemic is gonna continue to be around for a while, then why hasn't the city done mass distributions of PPE supplies? And, you know, and sanitizer. And to this day, they haven't really done it. Uh, they started to do some aspects of it maybe about a month ago. Um, and so I, I had to remind him uh, uh, of that. And I, I pissed him off and he was angry. I said, you're patting yourself on your back. I, don't, I said, you know, why are you patting yourself on the back? There's still people in our community that's dying. And so anyway, so we're still doing it. We're still, we're still doing these PPE distributions. Uh, we've made a lot of progress. You know, we have we have uh, made a lot of noise as well too, and talked about our angst with the with the with the government uh, on the local level. We've gotten a lot of tension in that, and now people are looking to to sponsor or, or support us and you know form partnerships. And we're also holding the business community. I want to say that it's it's not only the government has spelled this, but I think the business folks also have a responsibility to do their part because it's not it's not. Uh, they shouldn't wash their hands of the responsibility of simply providing you a mask when you go to work. They should provide you mask, not for you when you go home and for your family as well, and those things. Um, and, uh, and I tell people, this is just not a Latino issue. You know, we're almost 40% of the population. So if it's impacting us, it's impacting you because when you go pick up your groceries or go to the grocery stores or pick up your food, more than likely it's gonna be somebody who looks like us. And if they're sick, then you're exposing yourself to that. So you want to ensure that our people have what they need uh, to ensure that they stay uh, safe and, uh, and healthy. So I'm sorry, I think I went off track there on what we were talking about. No, no, I mean, that, that was, I mean, you answered both, both parts of my question, I think. Um, I, I, I just, you keep, you know, you brought up a couple of times this, your interactions with the mayor and it's clear you have, you know, you have a personal relationship with them. And I guess just from your perspective or, or you know, from what they told you and just from your, own opinion, you've been in politics a long time, which we can talk about a little bit later. But I mean, it's just hard for me to believe that a public official in a city like this, that sort of, at least in certain communities, prides itself for being progressive and, and whatever, like, how could, when y'all went to him with that, look, help us make this task force, help us do these specific, we have a plan for mitigating the impact in the Latino community. How could his answer have been no? Like, and how can he still I mean, and we don't, you don't have to, you know, if, I mean, you can say whatever you want, but you, we don't have to necessarily just bash Adler, but I mean, what is it about the government here, the local government that makes them just not act? Why, are, why, is it, why has this been left for so long to organizations like, like the ones you're working with? Well, so one thing that I learned and we all learn later as a coalition that I think he didn't say, and it could be that maybe we just didn't give him an opportunity to say this at that meeting that I referenced that was a pivotal point uh, that we've now learned. And in retrospect, I think we knew, but it was just not something that we were cognizant of the time. I didn't know how much it was influencing what was happening on the local, the local level. So because we're in a national pandemic, that triggers the federal government to be leading and dictating or providing guidelines to all the states. So if you look at the leadership, it's Trump, and then here in Texas, we have Abbott, right? And so, um, and then on the local level, each county then has their uh, Office of Emergency Management, and then the city has their as well. So you have all of these layers of bureaucracy, right? 
And if you don't follow those guidelines or adhere to what the Trump administration and then the Abbott administration is telling the local officials, then you put yourself at, real, at a vulnerable position from the perspective of um, in-kind support, resources, financial support, you probably are going to be at the bottom of the totem pole if you don't adhere to what it is that they're following, right? So I think some of that was occurring. And because you had all these layers and you had all of these task forces and committees, the mayor felt in essence now in retrospect, because he and I have talked about it, uh, is that, uh, that we would lose uh, the decision tree for us to make decisions with the task force and going through the process would become too politicized or take too long. But, you know, and so I think that's what, why he said what he said, but he never said that at that meeting. Um, and we later on figured out in conversation I'm having with you, I've had with the mayor. I disagree with him, but I know that I can always call him. He's a personal friend and we fight all the time, <laughs> you know, and there's be times when we don't speak for a month but I feel comfortable enough that I can text him or call him and I know that he'll call me back and we'll get into a shouting match and we'll hang up on each other. And so I also should say the fact that um, we have three Latinos on the Austin city council for the first time. Um, I no longer have a friendship or do I speak to the mayor pro tem Delia Garza. Um, I've known her for eight years longer, actually longer than that, but I no longer speak to her because of, the pandemic. Um, I, I can't speak to Greg Kassar. I had one conversation and said all I needed to say to him. And then Beal, God bless him, he tries. Um, and he was probably the only council member. He was the only council member who was at initial meeting with the mayor. And he did some Spanish translation for us early on. And he's tried to help, right? Uh, but the other, you know, the other, the other two were not. Uh, and I felt in essence that they politicize um, and took advantage of what's been going on to our community for their own personal agenda. Delia already had one foot out the door because she was running for county attorney. Greg Kassar was too busy as a socialist trying to get on the national platform and then trying to pick fights with Abbott. And instead of paying attention to the people in their communities, um, they were too busy doing those things. Um, and so, um, we invited the mayor pro tem to a conversation. I had conversations with him. She told me she was overwhelmed with her campaign, with what was going on the council. Uh, and then remember, this is when the national unrest was going on with the Black Lives Matter movement. All these things were happening, you know, the, the police, the riots, all those things. And so I can understand that, right? I can understand that. But at the same time, if you're not taking care of your basic fundamentals of the fact that you're a council member for this district or the fact that you are a Latina, Latino council member, and you also have a responsibility to your people, whether they live in your district or not. And so if they're not advocating for what it is that we're asking for, then it, it doesn't become a priority for the rest of the council. Now I should say, we went to other council members. So when it came to hitting the walls and not being able to get access to PPE supplies, it was council member Ann Kitchen, it was council member Leslie Poole, it was council member Allison Alter and the mayor because we were a pain in his ass uh, who were the ones who have provided us contacts and PPEs and support. It wasn't the Latino council members. With Kassar, he and I had a one-on-one -on -one conversation. I take it personal with him because my parents live in his district. My parents are both 80, uh, they had been in quarantine um, and when he first ran for council in 2014, he went and asked my parents for their support. My parents haven't seen him in over six years and he's up for reelection. And I reminded him of that. I said, for me, it's personal because my parents live in your district. My sister and my niece and nephews live in your district. And I reminded him that, he, you know, my parents hadn't seen him since he got elected for council. He goes, well, I'll go visit. I said, no, don't go visit them because my mother will run you off her property. Um, she's not interested in seeing you. And so that's my point is like, you know, while he's busy fighting the governor and then trying to get on the national platform, he's not taking care of what he, he has abdicated his responsibility to serve the people in his district. And in my opinion, Delia Garza did the same thing as well. So we don't speak at all. 
And so I remind people of that. That is uh, really fascinating because I, did, you know, I I try and pay attention to local politics. Didn't know anything about, you know, didn't have that perspective. And I, I guess since we're already talking about this, let's, because um, this idea of local, like Austin level politics, Latino representation, um, just Latino politics, I guess in general. You had told me in our pre-interview that you were chief of staff for Gus Garcia. That is that early two thousands. Is that when he is? So. I worked for Gus from 1992 until 2002. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. and so I met with, I worked with him when he was a council member for place five. Um, and then, um, and then he moved to another seat and then he was our mayor pro tem. Mm -hmm. And then he ran for mayor in 2001. And so, yes. So, so I ran his mayoral campaign and then I was his chief of staff when he got elected, but I had worked with him for the previous years as well. And you are, you're also, correct me if I'm wrong, please, you're one of the founding members of the uh, Hispanic Quality of Life Commission that still exists today. Is that correct? Is what you said that? So I, I was actually the consultant for the city for the Hispanic Quality oh. of Life Initiative. And initially the prelude was uh, some work that I did with the, at that time it was the Capital Area United Way, the Greater Austin United Way, um, where they were having conversations about trying to find Latinos to serve on the boards of the nonprofits that they were funding and partnering but we used, I did a study for them in developing a demographic profile of the people who were volunteering with the nonprofits that they served. And then we use that basis as a foundation for facilitating a citywide Hispanic quality of life initiative in 2006 and 2007. And so I was a consultant in that, which eventually led to the creation of the Hispanic Quality of Life Commission. Well, I guess um, I'd like to, as to sort of make it this more personal now for a little bit and ask you, so you're a lifelong Austinite, multiple generation Austinite. Um, can you can you talk a bit about how you got involved in local politics and what the arc of that? I know now you've for a long time you've uh, been working in the private sector as PR, but obviously you're still very involved. But especially focusing on that sphere where public life was your job, um, public service was your job. Uh, can you just talk about what it was like for you to get into that world, how you evolved in that world, how you ended up being, you know, chief of staff of, for the mayor of the city. Can you just talk a bit about your trajectory? Yeah, sure. So I was born and raised, grew up in East Austin on Riverview Street, um, which was one of the original uh, Mexican-American barrios. Our streets were not paved. We didn't have sidewalks. Um, I grew up, um, uh, my parents bought the house I grew up in in 1968 for $5,600. Today, that property is worth seven hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars. You know, my, my dad sold that property a long time ago to a single mom in the neighborhood. But the, the house on Riverview Street was right around the corner from um, Fiesta Gardens, which back which we used to call it as Chicano Park around there. Uh, Town Lake used to be Lady Bird Lake used to be Town Lake. Um, and then um, Fiesta Gardens was there. It's an interesting story. Fiesta Gardens used to be a private resort where the affluent white people, if they couldn't go away to Mexico, it was a private resort and nothing but Mexicanos worked there. And so they could go in there and get Mexican food, but they had this big old rot, rot iron, iron fence that went around the property that was not available to the body of the people who lived in the body. I lived right across the street from that. And so my friends and I would try and climb the wall, you know, climb the fence. And we did a couple of times and get in there. Um, so and eventually they turned that property over to the city. And then that's when the city used to do the Aquafest and the and those motorboat races. Um, you know, we just lost Paul Hernandez, who just passed away. Uh, and Paul Hernandez was known for um, uh, being part of a catalyst for the Brown Beret movement here in Austin, Texas, along with Gilbert Cortez Rivera, Susana Almanza, Gavino Fernandez, Susana Almanza, a lot of other folks. And so I was a kid and I remember because our house, our backyard, uh, basically opened up to, to Town Lake. And that's where they had those motorboats, which the greater Austin chamber, the white folks were the ones who would have the motorboat races in our neighborhoods. And you would have thousands and thousands and thousands of people who didn't live here, who would literally just come and raid our neighborhoods. Uh, and with no regard or respect for the Mexicanos that lived in that neighborhood. And so for me personally, I just remember growing up with that, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, we dreaded that time of the year because all these people would just invade our neighborhood who weren't from Austin. 
let alone from our neighborhood. And so I just remember that as a kid growing up. Uh, my father grew up in East Austin. Um, he was one out of seven. But my dad, uh, you know, had, a, had an education. He has a degree from St. Edwards University. Uh, my grandmother was, um, was, a, was a custodian and part-time. She had three jobs. She was a custodian. She, was, she worked at the poultry plant. And then she was a babysitter to all the grandkids, right? But my grandmother grew up with um, members of the LBJ family, with Cactus Pryor and some of these, because she would clean their offices. And so they knew my grandmother. So it was one of those things. Um, my grandmother also had a lot of friends that lived in the RBJ building. RBJ is a senior housing, affordable housing project that is still in East Austin that was built in the, light teen, in the, in the late 1960s. That's actually named for the mother of President LBJ. Her name is Rebecca Baines Johnson, which by the way, I'm on their board. I'm on their board now for the last 15 years. And, uh, but I remember as a kid, my grandmother would take me over there to go visit her comadres and the Guadalupanas that lived there in her in that building. It's funny, I'm, I'm on their board now. Um, so I think, you know, I remember all of these things. So um, I started working for the health department when I was going to St. Ed's and I found a temporary job as a mailroom clerk for the health and human services in department in 1988. And my job was to sort the mail. The first day I was there, I was doing training and I said, I didn't like the way they sorted the mail. So on day two, I found a typewriter in the warehouse and I wrote a memo and I said, this is how we're gonna do the mail distribution from on. on. I made copies of it and put it in all the, <laughs> all the boxes. And then one day this woman came in who had a heavy accent. Um, she had red hair, um, older lady. She had a heavy accent. She wasn't Mexicana, she wasn't Latina. Uh, and you know, she kind of gave me a look like, who are you? And I kind of looked back like, you know, I'm a Wakio young guy, you know, thinking like, who's this lady? And so she'd gotten one of the mailboxes, got the mail out included. On the top of her mail was my letter I had just written. And so within five minutes, I could hear her walking back. And she said, uh, did you write this? And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, come with me as a man. I'm going to get fired on day two. I'm walking down the hall. I don't know who she is. And turns out she was the director and the health authority for the Health and Human Services Department. And she said, I like your initiative. She goes, from now on, you're going to work for me. And so that ended up uh, leading to me being what was called a single point of contact. When anybody from the city manager's office or council office would need to get, um, uh, had a request for information, or if they were contacted by a constituent who was complaining about something, I became that single point of contact for the council members and the city manager. And then I would facilitate getting a response from our department as to what happened with those individuals. Uh, and so that kind of became my accidental uh, way into the, the, the policy and the politics. And then I got recruited to go work at City Hall by a woman named Toby Futrell, who was doing an audit of our department. Toby Futrell eventually became the city manager for Austin. But at, she, when, she wor when she went to work for City Hall, she went to work for the assistant city manager who was over our health department. So then I got recruited to go work at City Hall for one of the new assistant city managers, a Latino named Oscar Rodriguez. And he liked the fact that I was from Austin, from the barrio. And then that's how I met Gus. I already had heard about Gus. Gus got elected in 91. Uh, and so basically I ended up going to work in Gus's office on a temporary basis because one of his policy persons went to run a, a campaign for a guy named Rafael Quintanilla who was running for school board. And so one of Gus's aides went to go run that campaign. She decided she wouldn't come back. So I ended up staying in his office permanently. Um, but the, the position that I got uh, at City Hall, I got hired as an executive secretary. Back then they were still using the terms secretary and executive. And I didn't care, that didn't mean anything to me. All I knew is that I was interested in the policies and politics. And if I could influence as a male secretary, I was the first, it was quite scandalous because all the other folks were not happy that they hired a male secretary. And I didn't, I owned it, you know, I, 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 I embraced that title, right? But then I eventually became the office manager for Gus, scheduled his appointments, and then eventually I became one of the policy aides, and then eventually I became his chief of staff, you know, and so that's sort of my introduction into policy, if you will, and 
Um, a lot of the interests that Gus had, you know, he was the first Mexican American elected to school board uh, in 1972. Uh, and when I got elected to the school board in 2014, he swore me in as the, as the school board member. And so, um, you know, I, and just because a lot of things were happening in East Austin, uh, uh, you know, the, the zoning land use issues, um, I did a lot of work on that area, um, working in the MAC, bringing the MAC to fruition, a lot of those things, just a lot of things were important to me from that, my neighborhood that I grew up in. And I think it worked just because I had experienced it as somebody who grew up in that neighborhood and a lot of the issues that were happening with the Latino community, I could personally attest to or had family members. And then a lot of people who lived in East Austin have known my family for generations and generations. So that's the long wind of it. No, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, so if I'm getting the time right, timeline right, you're what, mid to late 20s when this is happening? Like when this is, when you're first getting involved in here in these, in these ranks? Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and, and I should also say why I was going to, to school, I got married when I was 22. I was already married. I got divorced. And then I was a single parent and I was raising two boys, three and five, and then going to school and then working full time. And so I was fortunate my parents and my sister would help me with my boys. My boys are Ryan's 29 and Josh is 26 now. Um, but yeah, that, that was all happening while I was doing that. And so that definitely opened up a lot of opportunities and doors for me, for sure. So you've been busy all your life, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of, but I, I get I get my... Um, probably my community activism and not, uh, shot, you know, my, uh, about sharing my opinions publicly. I probably inherited that from my mother. Uh, my mom is known to be pequeño, pero picosa. And so, uh, you know, she's never shy about sharing her feelings. You know, my dad said that, um, uh, and this is not funny, but I'll say it just because, and knowing my dad and my mom, it'll put it in perspective. My, my dad says that my mother's going to kill him before COVID will kill him because, She's just driving him crazy, you know, and so I get my being outspoken from my mother. <laughs> yeah, typical. Sounds like a very typical um, madre, right? Like that role, oh, yeah. the Latin American, the Mexican American mother. Absolutely. Um, so, could you? So, you mentioned a couple of these issues, um, things like land redevelopment and, and segregation, gentrification, but specifically about about this time. So, when you're first coming into this political scene, you're working with Gus Garcia. Can you sort of elaborate on what are the policies of, you know, specifically some of the policy work or, or the, just the ideals that he had that you think attracted you or that influenced you? And like, what was the landscape, political landscape of Austin like at the time? What were the, you know, today we talk about gentrification and, and other issues, but the homeless um, ordinances and there's a lot of controversy. But back then, I mean, you know, 90s, the, the, in the 90s, what are some of the most salient issues that stick out to you? Well, so one thing I should say, so back then, remember, we still had um, at-large elections. And so um, we were part, Gus was part of what was called the gentleman's agreement. And so um, it used to be uh, that there were five aldermen uh, on the council um, and they were all elected at the same time. And then those five would determine who the mayor and mayor pro tem would be. And so I think it was probably in the late 1960s an African-American gentleman by the name of Arthur DeWitty ran for alderman and he came in a close seventh and that was too close for comfort for the white guys. And so they had a meeting uh, in the basement somewhere and they decided that they were going to expand the council uh, from five to seven members. And the African-Americans, the Latinos would get one seat and the blacks would get one seat. And so um, that's how we ended up with um, a council of seven we had six council members and then the mayor, seven. So place five was the designated Latino seat and place six was the designated African-American seat. When Gus got elected in 91, um, uh, he came in into the Latino seat. And so by default, that meant that he had to carry uh, the burden uh, and the responsibility of advocating for all of the Latino issues, regardless of where you lived in Austin, Texas. Um, and so for me personally, you know, obviously that was something I took on very seriously in the work that I did with him. And so as somebody, you know, and at that time, keep in mind, uh, a lot of people don't know. And so until 1997, most of the property in East Austin, even the neighborhoods, the residential area, 
all of that property was zoned limited industrial, commercial, or CS1. So that is when they, and this gets back to the 1928 master plan. So when, when the 1928 master plan came to fruition and they moved all of the black and brown communities to east of East Avenue back then, now I-35, they did a blanket rezoning of all that property into commercial and industrial uses. At that time, Austin was sort of the, the city to go to in the US because of the uh, industrial uh, and commercial businesses that was happening here uh, and the rail lines that were built. So there are a lot of gravel quarries. That's why you see a lot of train tracks in East Austin. And sometimes they just dead end just because that's where all the warehouses and the, and the quarries were back in the day. And so it wasn't until uh, 97 that the city, this one's working with Gus, and, and, and before then, keep in mind, we had the Holly Power Plant. If you follow Rivery Street uh, as far east as you can go, it dead ends where the Holly Power Plant used to be. And it was only three blocks from where I lived, okay? And then, uh, then we had um, chemical plants, recycling centers, tank farms, um, all of those things were in East Austin. And the reason those were allowed to be put in East Austin was again, our little single family houses, we didn't know had been zoned commercial or limited industrial, right? So that didn't change um, until 1996, 97, when the city asked for a formal zoning and land use study. And this is some of the work that I did with Mayor Gus at the time. And so basically that report confirmed what we already knew was that 90% of the commercial limited industrial types uses, more intrusive zoning was east of I-35 in the barrios where the black and brown people lived. We, and we knew that. And so that led to what was called the neighborhood planning process. What the neighborhood planning process was supposed to do was it was supposed to empower the communities that had been marginalized for 70, 80 years and to give them a formal role and voice in the future redevelopment of their neighborhoods. So the, plan, so the, the way it was envisioned is they would do a neighborhood plan, they would lead it, you know, and say, these are all the things that are priority for us. These are all the things we'd like to see in our neighborhood. And then they would do the plan and then they would, the council would adopt the neighborhood plan and then they would adopt the zoning that conformed with that plan. But parallel to this, what was also happening was, um, I mentioned Oscar Rodriguez, the assistant city manager that I first went to work for. I was one of the staffers to the Barton Creek Task Force. And that was when there was a big environmental fight. You'll have to Google this and look it up. There was a guy named Jim Bot Moffitt. He owned something called Freeport McMoran. They were doing a lot of development and had acquired a lot of property over the Edwards Aquifer in Southwest Austin. Um, and keep in mind, remember in the early 1990s, SOS, Save Our Springs Coalition, was the environmental movement or movement of that time. And so there was a uh, a referendum that called for the passage of SOS and a lot of legal cha challenges. Gus was on the council. Judd, Gus was actually the swing vote to legally challenge that, which eventually led for the successful implementation of SOS. So Gus was, is still as day a hero to the environmental community because he was that swing vote. So I came in as one of the staffers along with a lady named Laura Huffman, who's now the executive director, president for the Greater Austin Chamber but she used to work for the uh, TNRCC as well on the state level. So she and I were the staffers to the, to the Barton Creek Task Force thing. I mentioned that was because parallel to us doing the neighborhood planning process, mayor, uh, the mayor at that time was Kirk Watson, who is now a retired Senator. Um, and so he was our mayor at that time and he was a litigator, very good attorney. So he played a key role in trying to develop a compromise and agreement between the environmental community and the business community and he came up with this, what's called the smart growth matrix, which basically would um, encourage or discourage redevelopment over the Edwards aquifer, aquifer and the recharge zone uh, uh, from a water quality perspective, because that our, that's our drinking water supply source, right? And he, they basically ended up labeling everything east of I-35 as our desired development zone. That, what didn't happen was there were never any tools I remember being in conversations about gentrification. 
we weren't calling it that we we're calling it other things i can't remember the term that was being used back then but we couldn't get enough support and there wasn't enough interest and they said well let's do the neighborhood plan stuff let's do this first and we'll get to that well we never got to that point right and so that in retrospect has become sort of the demise um if you will i think of what has happened is because we didn't put anything in place to mitigate the impacts nobody could have ever ever expected and kudos to the community because it was the people in our community in our barrios who led the efforts to change the zoning and to do the neighborhood plans and i always remember a quote that susana almanza from poder says and and she said it very eloquently she said we became victims of our own success meaning that we were the ones who advocated for getting rid of the holly power plant, the chemical plants, the tank farms, the recycling centers. Nobody could have ever imagined that the little casitas like my dad bought in 1968 for $5,600 today are selling for a million dollars and up. Nobody could have ever expected that, right? And so I was around during that whole time as well uh, when, when all of that um, happened, just because I can personally attest to it. That was part of my li living experience as well my family's living experience as well. And so um, so it's sad to see what's going on today um, because over the course of the last 40 years, the council has adopted more than 450 resolutions or ordinances that use the word gentrification in it. And so to this day, we really don't have any mitigation plan to address the displacement which is why there's now the, what's called the People's Plan that Susana Almanza and Poder and many black and brown leaders formulated and put pressure on the council to do. You know, uh, If you look at the council now, uh, I guess Bio is probably the only native Austinite, actually uh, Harper Madison is a, is a native Austin as well. So she, from here she left and then she came back. Um, so you have two council members out of 11 who are native Austinites. And so they lose sight of all that. It's a sore, it's a sore subject these days. What is it like for you to walk through um, you know, East Austin and or, or see, you know, I, I I'm thinking of when I think of like these phenomena, I'm thinking of like Rosewood or East Caesar Shop, you know, these incredibly just like yuppified areas that were one i mean what is that for you what what is that i mean can you describe it, what it, that's like it's painful it makes me angry you know um i often refer to it as uh, all we have left are the are the uh, photographic eulogies because everybody will post pictures man here's so and so remember we used to go here yeah a lot of places businesses have gone uh you know and have been, you know there's been pressure to buy them out um or have closed and certainly during this pandemic you know those they were already holding on um, because the property values and taxes have just become crazy. Property taxes and values have increased east of I-35 more than 600%, you know? So you have people who are in limited income, whether it's the seniors or the businesses themselves, they can't afford it. And a lot of people were losing their houses because they couldn't pay, you know, the back taxes of $7,000. On average, there was a study that was done by some group, I can't remember, but the average, person who lost their property on average owed about $7,000 in taxes. And then somebody comes and offers them $150,000 cash. They demolish the house and they flip it and they're selling it for a million dollars, 750,000 to a million dollars and up, you know, then it's, it's, it's um, basically exploiting uh, and taking advantage of and victimizing our people all over again when they get, when they get the short end of the stick. So it's painful to see, right, uh, that. Uh, and so, you know, and then, and then I think what's particularly painful is also when you hear the gentrifiers coming in and they'll say, we're coming in to clean up your neighborhood or we're coming up to clean up, you know, it's, or where you'll see the 80 year old woman who will put out her, you know, her decorations during Easter. I mean, during Christmas, you know, her lights and her, you know, you know, whatever it is that she has and indicative of our cultura, right? When the posadas, all that stuff comes around and then their neighbor is a condo, somebody who lives in the condo across the street or right next to, and then they're complaining and they're referring to her yard decorations as, as junk, 
Like you're, you're making my property tax now, my property value is decreasing because of all the junk you have or you're putting up in your yard. I mean, that's an insult, you, know, you see that. Um, and so, and, and still today, you still hear, will hold people, you're, you, you will hear people um, say that. What's interesting is, I don't know if you caught the article a couple of weeks ago, the US Census put out the latest um, community survey data. The Latino population in Austin has decreased more than 10%. So what the African-American community went through 15 years ago, when their population was at 15 and 13%, they're now 8%. It's starting to happen now to the Latino community. Our population has decreased more than 10% since 2010. Are, you're not seeing that on the front lines of any story at this point. There was a little article that the statesman did about it. Uh, and the only reason I know about it was because the reporter called me and I was quoted in that article. Uh, but it's a very small piece, but nobody else is paying attention to it. The council's not paying attention to it. It, it just seems like you, like you and other activists and, and people who are the, just the people who live in these neighborhoods who are trying to push back against this, it honestly just seems like you are up against something that is unstoppable, right? Like it seems like the, the, the money and the power and you know the tirelessness of the efforts to gentrify this that that part of Austin and like you say just expel minority communities as a result it just seems like so insurmountable do you have any optimism about I mean what what do you long term you know from here 20 years from now what do you envision East Austin and these communities as as being well I refer to I refer to the native Latino and native African Americans as endangered species we have, we have jumped the salamander on the endangered species list in Austin. You know, it's, it's, you're not gonna see us anymore. Every time I go to East Austin, I see something new that I haven't seen. It looks so different uh, and it's, it's, it's devastating. I think the nail in the coffin was where, when we got to the point where two years ago, AISD started closing the schools in East Austin. You know, the brook, I went to Metz, uh, elementary. The original Mets was torn down uh, and rebuilt, and then they just they actually just closed it again. So they closed six schools, and they either closed they closed four schools and consolidated six in total. Um, all of them, with the exception of one, were schools in East Austin, all Title One schools, black and brown schools. Um, they closed Peace, which was downtown, uh, but that was a majority minority school, and they closed that one as well. And then uh, the other thing is um, the, uh, the high school formerly known as Johnston High School, which has been there for almost 60 years, they are moving that school and the students to another part of town to accommodate the rich, of, the rich white kids from Lhasa High School. So they're moving them from LBJ in Northeast Austin. They're gonna move to Eastside Memorial the kids from Eastside Memorial, and that school is, they're, they're building a new school, but it's in District 1. So that means that East Austin AISD District 2, because school district also has single member districts. So East Austin AISD District is District 2. That will be the only single member district in AISD without a comprehensive high school to educate poor black and brown kids. And this is liberal progressive Austin in 2020. And so next year is the last year that school is open and then they'll be forced to go to a new school and say, oh, but we're building you a brand new shiny school. That's not the point. That would not have been tolerated in any other part of town. And so, and that gets to my days of the school board. I got interested in public education because of the work that Gus did. Education was always very important to him. I did a lot with work with young people. My wife is a, is a public school teacher. We have four boys. I mentioned being a single parent but I still managed to go to PTAs and do all those things. I was involved in the public education for my kids. Also knowing just the way I grew up in my experience with being a product of desegregation uh, and then also having dyslexia and not being, not being um, correctly, um, I guess, what's the word? I guess diagnosed until my sophomore year in high school because that was the first school I had been to for more than one year after second grade. And so I just remember that being my experience and not having an advocate for me. And so I know I was always interested in public education. And then I ran for school board in 2014 and I got elected 
Um, and like I said, when I got when when it came to picking somebody to swear me in, of course, Gus did that for me. What um, so that's like school board and local. Those those are the elections that people tend to pay the least attention to. You know, ironically, like can you talk about what kind of work? So how you know you you were able to. Or, or what you were trying to do to be an advocate for, you know, for students like that you had been, what, what does that work actually entail? What are you able to do to like push the needle in certain direction? Well, so when I got elected to the school board, um, there are nine people on the school board. Um, and one of the things that was happening and one of the reasons I ran for school board was this thing about closing and consolidations had started happening, you know, was always on a, a point of contention with the school district and the community. I was a strong critic of the district. Um, and in particular, the, the, the two superintendents prior to Dr. Paul Cruz who just left. And so I was a pain in their ass on purpose, uh, advocating for them. I got along with Dr. Forjon and then Maria Kastarpin came in and she was the one who picked a couple of schools and brought in idea charter schools into the system. And she, interrupted a, a perfectly beautiful campus um, and that became really um, her demise and then the demise of four trustees. That's how I met Gina Hinojosa who's now a state rep because that year Gina decided to run for school board um, and so I was always involved and it was a critic of Kostarpin because um, she was not from here. She didn't understand and didn't believe in being transparent, inclusive and communicating authentically with folks in the community. Uh, but also because of the work that I had done. And remember, we heard it form ABLA, uh, and we were already uh, sort of monitoring what the school district was doing. We were noticing a pattern of um, low performance schools all being located east of I-35. Um, they would put the inexperienced teachers east of I-35. Um, black and brown kids were being told these were the only schools that you can go to. Uh, and so, um, but what I learned to do over the years, and this gets back probably to my policy experience, was I was very good at um, deciphering the data and using their data against them. So I would say, these are not my words, these are your words. Your data says this, and I would present their data, and I would use that to hold them accountable. And so that sort of became my inspiration. Um, it's interesting because Lori Moya, uh, who served in District 6, the seat that I ran is the daughter of Richard Moya, who was the first Mexican-American elected uh, to office. He was our, our first Mexican-American elected as a Travis County Commissioner for Precinct 4. Lori Moya served on the school board three terms. Um, she supported Dr. Kostarfin in the controversial uh, vote to bring the charter schools. And so um, I was already involved as a community advocate. Uh, I did press conferences and protest and then I put it out there early on, even though I really wasn't ready to do it. Uh, I wasn't interested in running. I always prefer working for the candidates, but I put it out there early that I was going to run against her. Um, and whether or not that had an influence on her personal decision, I don't know. But I know that I had had some passionate conversations with her about how I felt about her role and what she was doing and her involvement. Um, and so uh, and then I was also beginning to see a pattern of uh, fewer Latinos on the school board. So when, when I got elected and served in 2014, I was the only Latino out of nine trustees. And at that time, the Latino student population was almost 60% of the student population. Today, it's 53% lower. So then it was funny how it kind of came full circle, parallel to Gus in that when he was on the council, he was the only Latino and I worked for him. And then me being the only Latino on the council, on the school board, but then the way the school board is, you're full time. It's it's a full time volunteer. You don't have any staff, you know. And so it was hard. And so a lot of people who are getting elected to the school board, they had the personal means to be able to serve on there. So issues around equity, segregation, those are the things we talked about when I got on the school board. I worked with Dr. Ted Gordon, who was the only African American on the school board, and we forced a conversation with Gina Hinojosa's help because she was president of the school board at the time. And we told her we wanted to have conversations about equity and equal. And she goes, well, what if we create a committee? And we said, okay. And then she says, but Paul, since you brought it up, you have to chair it. So I had to chair that subcommittee of the board. So we spent four months trying to come up with a definition of what equity and equal meant to the trustees, right? 
So that was an interesting conversation. So I spoke about my experience, what I told you. And what I, and what, what I said was, at the end of the day, it's not what we think equity and equal should be. It should be based on the lived experiences of the students and families that we served. That's what the definition of equity and equal should be. And I think people are able to relate to that because when I talked about my personal experience, everybody went around the table and talked about what their personal experience was. And we agreed that I could invalidate your experience just like you couldn't invalidate mine. And so then we, that started, that was the core of our conversation. And then we started breaking it out and said, and we arrived, okay, our focus should be on the students and families we're serving, right? And we talked about the data. There's a 30 or 40 point differential between uh, the gaps and the achievement between black and brown students and white students. And how do we close that? We talked about the fact that we still had segregation in our schools. And even today in 2020, we have 22 schools that are majority white and affluent located west of 35, except for one school is, Las, is um, Lhasa, which is then gonna, it's in Northeast Austin, and now it's gonna be moved into East Austin, but they're kicking out our kids to accommodate, you know, that. So that's still going on, it's still going on. Yeah, I think, um, was it this year, this past year that they brought in an equity, they, the school district like brought in an equity person and she said, this is what structural racism looks like, like pointing, this is, this is what it looks, so it's still clearly happening. Um, and I just, well, I actually wanted to, before I wanted to ask you, you mentioned this charter school decision and how that was particularly influential in your, can you just explain why the issue of charter schools is so like contentious and what it means here specifically? Well, the, the, the point of contention was that um, obviously, you know, they, they put the charter schools and consider charter schools to be public schools, right? Um, but the, the way it was viewed and accepted by the community our experience by the community was that the the the, the superintendent, Dr. Starpin, was trying to ab, abdicate her responsibility for educating poor black and brown kids, and she wanted to turn it over to another school system within the public school system of AISD. But then, for her to pick a school that was doing very well on their own, they were you know meeting all the academic standards, majority poor black and brown kids, more Latino than African American. And so there was there was no there was no strategy or formula as to how she picked that school. But more importantly, she made that decision independent of the community and the and the folks who were directly impacted by that decision. Uh, and again, we viewed it as her trying to abdicate her responsibility. We hired her at that time. I can't remember how many schools we had. 130. We didn't hire her just to be the superintendent for these schools and not those schools, kind of thing. And so that became a very sore subject. And I think, you know, uh, here in Austin, people want to be involved in the decision-making process. And if you're not gonna adhere to our community expectations and cultural values, then we're gonna make your decision and your job very difficult. And that's what we did. So I guess, um, um, uh, what time is it actually, just to make sure. Are you, do you, do you have, have, do you? Um, yeah, I have a, a meeting at uh, three, 30, so I've probably got about 10 more minutes. Okay, all right. Uh, well then, you know, just as a um, sort of a, a way to finalize this, like, so this idea of local politics, you know, is really interesting, especially now during the pandemic. And, and Dr. Maggie, like has said a couple of times that, um, you know, this is just exposed fractures and problems and inequalities that were already existing. It's just, it's just made them much more evident and, and sort of shined a, shined a light on them. Um, so I guess I, just if you can talk about what you think the role of like these very this very local hyper localized politics like especially focused on you know marginalized community marginalized communities in this case Latino politics like where do you see the spaces for that that are going to be so urgent and so important here again just specifically here in Austin as the pandemic continues but also you know when this inevitably when things inevitably return to some sort of normal, right? Like, what do you think is going to be the forefront for these political battles that need to take place? Um, and yeah, just sort of what, what do you see that the actors in those spaces is doing? Well, I know that one thing our Latino, Austin Latino Coalition has committed to is that when this thing is over, that we're going we're gonna to write a report and we're going to make the rounds and we're going to publish uh, and tell the stories of what we experienced and what we viewed and more importantly, what our people experienced to reiterate the complete failure, not only of the feds and the state, but local, locally 
and the fact how sad that it was done under the watch with three Latinos on the city council. Um, and I think, you know, Maggie's correct is, and, and we sort of alluded to this in that it has certainly unmasked the historic inequities that our community has been subjected to. And obviously that has become even more exploited during this pandemic. Um, so we're being victimized all over again. Um, and it's sad that it's happening here in Austin, Texas as well. Um, but um, that is certainly has been something that inspired me. Day one of early voting, I went to vote because that's what I had in mind is I wanna hold the people um, accountable for what my community has been through. And I was voting for the 207, 217, 220 Latinos that have been lost from our community. I was also voting to honor them, to make sure that our families and our community doesn't go through that again. So I look forward to when this thing is over, but we're gonna reflect on it. This is probably one of the darkest days for Austin's history and for our nation, right? Uh, for sure. Well, thank you, Paul, uh, for being generous with your time. I know it's been, you're busy, so I really appreciate it. I know Dr. Maggie appreciates it as well. And well, thank it's you. Really, I appreciate really happy to speak with you. Thank and you, likewise, brother. I'm going to stop the recording.